I'm Sebastian St. James. Today I will provide you with proof of where you should invest your money. Over many years, I've collected mountains of data and I've built custom-made tools to interpret that data. Today, we'll go on a journey together and pick out which assets on the asset catwalk you want to go home with. Will it be this one? Perhaps you want to invest in something trendy and rebellious. Or will it be this one? Perhaps you want to invest in something a little bit more colourful. Or will it be this one? Perhaps you want to invest in something more old-fashioned and stable. Dividends. You want the high returns of the stock market, but is there something that makes your returns more stable? The question is, do dividends actually work as a stabilisation factor on your stock market returns? Bank dividend cuts to deliver blow to retirees and investors. The National Australia Bank also slashes its dividend payout by 64%. Clearly, dividends can be cut, so they're not 100% stable, but the question is, do they provide a greater degree of stability than stock prices alone? Oh, here's a graph. This is the ASX 200 versus the ASX 200 total return. What is the difference? Well, it's the word total return. I thought that would have been obvious to you. That means plus dividends, right. So we're mapping stock prices alone versus the stock price with the dividends added back in. Clearly, if you add dividends, you get a higher return. So that's a red line, but I am noticing there is little dots going through that. What's that? That is a line of best fit. I see, and we've got a separate line there for each of the results. Good. The line of best fit is actually calculated mathematically. In other words, it's real, it's definitive, and it works out the exponential line that's closest to all the data. In other words, goes through the middle of it. Once we have the line of best fit, and we use linear regression for that, then we figure out the error. How much does the result deviate from that line that goes through the middle? That determines how predictable they are or not. Here are Australian stocks without dividends versus Australian stocks with dividends over five years. Which of those follows its line of best fit more closely? It's a little bit hard to say, to be honest. Well, I can go straight to the maths. R squared gives me the prediction number. So. ASX 200 without dividends is a 45.3% predictability, which is actually not that high at all, to be honest. On the other hand, add in the dividends, exactly the same data, but we've just added in dividends, jumps up to 74.7% predictability. Wow, okay, that's nice, and that's important. Here is 21.6 years, which is all our data. Okay, so this is a better story because it's longer. Well. Without dividends, the ASX 200 has a predictability of 68.5, which is actually not very good at all. Add in the dividends, 92.3, and I'm very happy with that. Well, that's your answer. Dividends, okay, they might go up and down, but they're clearly more stable than stock prices. The question is, what happens if you add in your franking credits? Does that make it even more predictable? Well, here is, goodness me, what is this? The ASX 200 without dividends. The ASX 200 total return, that means with dividends, and the total return plus franking credits, right, over 10.2 years, which is the whole of our data. Wow, that is a lot. So, what are the results? Add in the dividends, we get 94.1. Add in the franking credits, we get 95.7. Technically, the franking credits make it a little bit more predictable, but hardly any. So, it's the dividend itself that's adding most of the predictability, and yes, the franking credit adds a little bit of cream on the top. US stocks versus Australian stocks. Firstly, which one has the better return? This is the S&P 500 total return, which means including dividends, versus the ASX 200 total return plus franking credits. Why does the S&P not have franking credits? Because it's American. They don't have franking credits over there. And it's over one year. Well, who's won? Well, that's red. Red appears to be the ASX 200. Okay, that's beaten the S&P 500 total return, which is in blue. Well, give me the results. The S&P 500 total return is minus 9.34, and the ASX 200 with franking credits added in is 0.172, which is clearly positive and better than the Americans, as you can see. Over 10.2 years, and this is where we stop this graph. Well, the S&P 500 has had a return of 239%. The ASX 200 with franking credits and dividends is 165%. Well, that's a big difference. So. The CAGR for America is 12.7% and Australia is 10%. Both are very good, but clearly America is higher. Except that is not what happened. Look, if you're an Australian and you're talking to an American and your koalas are kissing, you probably think I'm making this up. As I said, if you're an Australian and you're talking to an American and your koalas are kissing, then this is actually what you got. These are the actual real results. 
But if you're an Australian and there's no koalas in the equation at all, you actually invest in Australian dollars into the US market and you leave it there for 10 years and what happens? Well, the currency pairs shift and then suddenly you bring it home, you've either got more or less than you bargained for. I have some new data never seen before on this channel. This is the AUD versus the USD over the last 43.2 years. That's the Australian dollar versus the US dollar. Okay, so that's exchange rate. Yes, I have it now in my graphing software. So using my godlike powers, I can take those raw currency exchange rates. I can take the raw data from the S&P 500. I can combine them in the crucible of fire. And lo and behold, my brand new creation. <laughs> Here it is. This is the S&P 500 total return, but in Australian dollars this time. Isn't that magnificent? It's like bringing a General Motors car across to Australia, calling it a Holden and pretending it's Australian. Now it's time for you to place your bets. If I graph the S&P 500 in Australian dollars over that period against the S&P 500 in US dollars, which one would actually win? I'll give you a moment to decide. Well, here are the results. Okay, I'm gonna to have to zoom in there. In blue, we have the total return. Okay, that's in US dollars. And in red, we actually have the Australian conversion. It appears to me that red is in front. Let me get the actual numbers. Aha, there it is. Over the 35.2 years, the US version returned 3,180%. Converted to Australian dollars, suddenly you get 3,380%. Actually, that's not too bad at all. But there you go, just by being an Australian, you can invest in the American market and beat the Americans at their own game. Well, specialists never end. I'm now about to do something very serious, something I've never ever done before on this channel, and with good reason. I'm about to dox one of my viewers and show you exactly where he lives. I know it's unusual, perhaps even unethical, but I feel it has to be done. This is it. This is where one of my viewer lives. Oh, it's in Adelaide. That's right, this is the man from Adelaide and he gave me a $2 thanks. Thank you very much, the man from Adelaide. That I really appreciate. So if you'd like to also say thank you, like the man from Adelaide, and know you don't have to be from Adelaide, then hit the thanks button below this video. Now it's time to compare the ASX 200 to the S&P 500, but this time the S&P 500 will be in Australian dollars. That's right, dollary dues. Well, here it is. Okay, what do we have? In blue, we have the S&P 500 total return, which means in dividends, but it's converted across to Australian dollars. You know where I got that data from. In red, we have the ASX 200 total return plus franking credit, so that's everything included. Unfortunately, the American version has won. Oh. Over 10.2 years, the S&P 500 in Australian dollars has returned 428%, at home, you've only got 165%, but that means the CAGR of America is 17.7%, Australia is 10%. That's a massive difference. Look at that. Okay, this is a difference that currency can make. Obviously, the Australian version is the same in both, but the American version, either 10.7% or 17.7%. It just depends on whether the currency was factored in or not. The thing about currency, though, it can go both ways. Yes, so you don't know whether the currency is going to go in your favour, which clearly this time it has, or whether it's going to go against you. It's, it's somewhat unpredictable. Getting franking credits for the entire stock market is actually very, very difficult. I, I can only get it from one place. So I can go back further if I kick aside temporarily this franking credit. So let me do that. Over 21.6 years, which is as far as we can go back. Or oh, who's winning? Ha! Australia is winning in red. Wow, look at that. Kick out franking credits and suddenly we win. So over that period, America has a CAGR of 6.85%, Australia 7.95%, and of course it'd be slightly higher than that. Wow, okay, that is impressive. I hope you're catching all the data that's whizzing past you. We've got to keep the video moving, but you are getting massive amounts of practical, useful data right now. Converting the S&P 500 back to Australian dollars is really useful if you're investing in it and your money's actually going over. But if you're not, if you're actually comparing how stable the markets are to each other, then your currency conversions might actually get in the way. You want to just compare the actual two results of the market directly with each other. The question is, should we actually convert all American indices to Australian dollars when we're talking about them? It's an interesting question because technically it could go either way. 
if I want to know the return and I'm going to actually invest my money in the American stock market, then yes, I want to all convert it back to Australian dollars because that's what I'd actually get. On the other hand, if there is the share price of Apple and I'm graphing that, and then I suddenly convert that back to Australian dollars, what, just because the currency's fluctuated in Australia and it might have nothing to do with Apple at all, suddenly the results of Apple are now skewed because of the Australian dollar? You could really argue for it to go either way. It would kind of depend on exactly what you're looking at to which was more useful. But the question is, what am I going to use on this channel going forward? Am I going to convert everything to Australian dollars so we can make that direct comparison? Or are we going to ignore the random fluctuations of the currency market? That I want to know from you. What would you like to see in the future? Let me know in the comments below. These are US shares versus Australia, all in Australian dollars, right? The S&P 500 converted to Australian dollars has a predictability of 97.3%. Wow, okay, that's really impressive actually. The Australian stock market, 95.7%. Look, technically the US is higher, but they're both so high. Yeah, they're both very, very good. America sneezes, Australia catches a cold. That's what they said about our stock market and about the economy. The question is, how closely correlated are the stocks in Australia to the stocks in the US? I predict quite correlated, but let's see exactly how much. Well, here they are. Oh, I can see they look quite correlated, don't they? Particularly there in year 2000, where they both magically dropped at the same time. The correlation between these two is actually 92.9%. Okay, that's extremely, extremely high. Here we're using the Pearson correlation coefficient to figure out whether these two sets of numbers are actually correlated or not. The reason why you'd be asking this question in the first place is because do I have some protection? Like if the Australian stock market dropped suddenly, would be investing in US stocks actually help to smooth things out? Apparently the answer is no, 92% correlated. They're basically exactly the same asset class. Over 10.2 years, okay, we've doubled it here. The correlation is 98%, oh my goodness. You couldn't get closer to 100% if you tried, basically. Bonds versus stocks. Which ones performs better? I think it's pretty obvious, but do bonds actually work as a hedge? So when the stock market crashes, bonds will smooth out your overall portfolio. Well, let's take a look. This is Australian bonds total return. Total return means the coupon that's been paid out plus any price fluctuation if you held the entire ETF, for example. Versus the ASX total return plus franking credits over one year. I'm seeing red is actually in the lead and who is red? Well, red is the ASX 200. It's returned a positive result and bonds have gone negative. Oh, okay. Now, obviously bonds have paid out a coupon within that period of time. I mean, they have to, but you know, the price has gone downhill, hasn't it? Bonds have had a return of minus 2.35%, including the coupon that they paid out. The ASX 200 over the same period, 2.43%. It's just almost like the same, and it's positive. Over five years, well, red's gone up, hasn't it? Look at that. Actually, on that graph, you can see something. Stocks, which is in red. And it had that great big dip in the year 2000, and bonds protected it. Well, it just basically went straight. So technically, at that point, yeah, if you had, say, 50% bonds, then you would actually be substantially protected. During this exact period, you were holding a good amount of bonds, you'd probably feel pretty cocky. However, if you just waited one extra year, you'd find that stocks would undo all the problems that they had and suddenly reverse everything. So over five years, bonds have a CAGR of 1.15%, stocks had a CAGR of 8.94, and that included the crash, which we just saw. Over 10.1 years, that little blip in the year 2000, you hardly even notice it. Bonds with a CAGR of 2.71% and stocks 9.17%. That's a substantial difference. So bonds underperform stocks, who would have guessed? The question is, do bonds have a smoother return, a more predictable return? You probably assume the answer is yes. Let's look at the data. Over the two years, what we do is we get the graph, we draw that dotted line, which is the line of best fit, and we say, what is the error between the actual results and that line of best fit? Right, got it. Bonds has had a predictability of 76.5%. Wow. And stocks, 30.7%. So, clearly, over a short period of time, well, in this particular two-year period, bonds were far more predictable than stocks. So there you go. So, does that answer your question whether bonds are more reliable than stocks? More reliable at going down? That's right, if you had a look at the graph, sure, more reliable, but it's going in the wrong direction. Oh. Over 10.1 years, there's the graph, the lines are best fit. 
and bonds has a predictability of 76.5% of cases, but stocks, on the other hand, is 95.5%. Mind blowing. Basically, 100% of you at home right now would have thought that bonds were more reliable, more predictable. Sure, they don't have the same return as stocks, but they smooth things out. Well, apparently, over the last 10 years, no, it's gone the other way. Stocks have been more reliable than bonds. I have a new channel member. Oh, let's see who it is. Let's call him Damo, because that's what he calls himself. You and I are going to go on a little hunting expedition to find out more about this new channel member. I can hardly wait. Here he is. This is a real picture of him. He is actually playing the guitar. He's playing the Faith No More Ashes to Ashes. Huh. Hang on, I can't really see him. Enhance. Ah, there he is. There you go, my brand new channel member. And he loves being strip searched. Oh, you think I'm making this up? Faith No More Strip Search Acoustic Cover by Damo. Exactly what I said. So highly talented with a guitar and now one of my channel members. Thank you very much, Damo, for joining up. I really appreciate that. Now, if you want to become a channel member and get all the perks that Damo's getting right now, hit the join button below this video. We just looked at Australian stocks versus Australian bonds. We looked at the predictability. Bonds didn't actually fare very well over that period of time. The question is, what about the correlation? When stocks drop, do bonds sail on? Well, I've seen some evidence of that. And that we can mathematically prove one way or the other. So let's take a look. All right, you've been sold the story that bonds actually act as insurance for your stock. Well, it kind of does in that over the five years. Yeah, I would say so. So let's see that mathematically. The correlation between bonds and stocks is 8.36%, which sounds terrible, but in fact, it's really, really good. The closer to zero, the better. That means they're totally uncorrelated. If that result was minus, it'd mean they're negative correlated. 8.36%, yeah, that, that's basically really good. Over 10.1 years, well, they seem a little bit more similar to me. So look at the numbers. Bonds versus stocks, 80.2%. Oh, so they're actually pretty highly correlated. I mean, it's not 90%, but it is very highly correlated at 80.2%. Okay. This is fascinating because in a crash, sure, bonds and stocks aren't correlated. This is absolutely true. The media will grab this story and then say, look, it's actually protection for your portfolio. Well, that's true if you're only holding bonds during the period of the crash. So sure, there's a little bit of asset protection, but over the long period of time, 80% correlation, they're, they're really quite closely linked. High interest savings account versus bonds. Ah, the money that you don't put in the stock market, should it go in the bank and stay there, hopefully in a high interest savings account, or do you actually buy out bonds? So this is Australian bond total return versus a high interest savings account over one year. Well, red is at the top and that's quite stable. That's bound to be the cash. And yes, it is. That's a high interest savings account versus bonds. The bonds in particular is the S&P ASX Australian Fixed Interest Index Total Return. In other words, I'm mapping an actual index here. Bonds in that period has returned minus 2.35%. Your bank account 3.58%, which is much nicer. So when I talk about bonds and it represents all bonds, exactly what index am I using and why am I using that particular index? Well, here is the reason. Firstly, I need an index that has total return. What does total return mean when it comes to a bond? Well, that means the coupons that are being paid out, that's like dividends for stocks, plus the fluctuation in bonds price because they're not just a coupon. No, if you actually own an ETF full of bonds, that price will go up and down and that is definitely where you can lose money. So why did I choose this particular index? Well, because it represents a basket of bonds. It's like a basket of stocks, except for, for bonds. And importantly, it actually is represented by one particular ETF. Take a look. This is Spider ASX 200 Australian Bond Fund, symbol bond. Its benchmark is the S&P 500 ASX Australian Fixed Interest Index. Uh-huh. And as you can see, it's exactly the same benchmark that I'm actually using. That's right, I'm mapping that exact index in my stock graph. So this is not actually a recommendation for me for you to go out and buy this particular ETF. I don't really care what ETFs you buy and don't buy. But if I've chosen an index where you could hypothetically buy exactly those results, then the results I show you on my graph suddenly become way more meaningful to you. Over 10.1 years, what have we found? Well, bonds has returned 30.9%. The bank has returned 54.4%. That's a big difference, isn't it? Bonds has a CAGR of 2.71%. Cash has returned 4.44%. Compound annual growth rate. Because I'm following one particular index and I'm following that index because I need the total return. 
price fluctuation of the bonds plus the coupons. I'm limited by what data they'll give me, which is 10.1 years. But what if I could actually even go back further in time? I have acquired a brand new data set since the bond video I did, which was the last video. And now, using that data, I can give you a whole brand new series of results. Here is the bond yields over 28.2 years. Wow, okay, this is very impressive, but exactly what is it? This is the yield and the yields alone. In other words, we're not talking about the price fluctuation of owning those bonds. We're just talking about the percentage that you'd get on the coupons. So what bonds did I particularly choose? Well, this is the Australian government bonds, the two-year bond. Well, why did I choose the two-year bond? That's an interesting question. Well, here are the bonds that the Australian government puts out. Two, five, 10, and 15 year. The question is, which is actually closer to a Hydra savings account? The answer is obviously the shortest one, and so that's why I choose the two-year yield. So, I've got the raw actual interest rates of bonds. The question is, do I have the raw interest rates of the cash, the high interest savings account? Well, here, take a look. This is a high interest savings account IR. What does IR stand for? Interest rate. Oh, over 40.9 years. Well, that's actually quite useful. Cash has changed. And the way I present cash on this channel from here on in is changing. Only the Standard & Poor's and myself have the power to create new indices, but I alone have the power to modify an index. That's right, I said let my high interest savings account index be even more useful. And it was so. Yes! Before we use the symbol HISA, which was the high interest savings account, it was actually the interest rates. And we had a second one, which was HISAC. Cumulative means you've got $1,000 in the bank. Let's see what happens and it grows over time. That's the one we're always using. We're actually using the cumulative one again and again. So I've made an executive decision. We're going to drop the C. So the cumulative, the one I'm graphing all the time in cash, is now going to be known as HISA because it's more intuitive. That's what we see all the time. It may as well get the best name. Hydra Savings Account, the actual one with just the interest rates, is now renamed officially to HISAIR, which stands for interest rates. Now we've got a nicer code. There's a second change I've made. The high interest savings account, that's the new code, has become generalized. Mm, what does that mean? Do you know that 30 years ago, nobody was using high interest savings account with bonus interest? Why not? Because they didn't exist. Back then, where basically you had no interest in your bank pretty much, or if you wanted any, then you had to put it in term deposits. That's what you signed up for. But interestingly enough, Back in those days when, obviously, humans cohabited with Neanderthals, there was ways of actually getting interest. So when I'm looking at the Hydra Savings Account with bonus interest, I am limiting myself by following that definition strictly. Sure, now, in modern times, I'm going to definitely follow that, but I need to go back in time and grab what humans were actually using back in those days of 20 years ago. Yes, I know, it's an amazingly long time ago and actually use that so we can go back in history and find out exactly what people were using to get the highest returns in cash if they put it in the bank. So what data did I actually use? From 20.6 years ago, Hydra Savings Account with bonus interest. Before that, it was term deposits for one month. Why one month? Well, you actually got a decent return on that. And secondly, it's short term, so it's closer to a Hydra Savings Account. It's no use comparing to something where you locked your money away for three years. So here it is. This is a high interest savings account for 41 years. So now I have the individual interest rates of cash going back for 40 years. And now I have the interest rates of bonds going back a long time, certainly longer than I could get from that specific ETF index. What are the results? Well, let's take a look. So over five years, the bond yields versus the yields of the high interest savings account. This is the actual interest rates itself. You can see two and a bit percent, yeah. Blue is bonds, red is cash. And so we're not actually worried about the very end result, which we would be if it was a percentage. We're more sort of after the average throughout that period of time. So let me give you those results. The bond yield has returned an average of 1.25%, the medium of 0.9. Cash in the bank has returned an average of 1.4% or 1.5% medium. So in other words, cash has done better over the last five years. Mm. Over the last 10 years, bonds has returned an average of 1.69%, which is a median of 1.86%. Cash in the bank, 2.18%, which is higher. Oh, and the medium's higher as well. Okay, so cash has actually done a lot better than bonds over the last 10 years. Over 28.2 years, which is all our data. Well, I'd say bonds is doing pretty well there on the left. 
Bonds has actually returned an average of 4.04%, cash 3.08, and the medium is 4. Points. Oh, so it's higher in both the average and the medium. Hmm, interesting, isn't it? So this leaves you with a bit of a question. Bonds over this entire period of time has actually outperformed cash. As far as the interest rate is concerned, remember, we're not dealing here with the ups and downs of bonds. It's strictly the interest rates alone. The question is, is that an indication that bonds actually are better overall, or has something fundamentally changed over the last 10 years? That I will address in a future video on this exact topic. The question is, what is more predictable? This is Australian bond total return. Okay, so total return. So we've gone back to that index, got you. And we've got the line of best fit, which we need to get the predictability score, got you. I'm noticing that bonds are actually dipping down there to the right, so that doesn't help them, I'm sure. Bonds have had a predictability of 76.5%. Hmm, high interest savings account, well, it's basically almost perfect at 94.4%. Huh. Kind of doesn't surprise me that money in the bank is actually more predictable than bonds, particularly the price of bonds go up and down. But there it is, in numbers. Now, how closely is cash and bonds actually correlated? Well, the correlation is 92%. Wow, over 10.1 years. That's basically pretty much the same asset class. So the question is, should you actually take some of your cash, put it into bonds and diversify, or do the other way around? Take some of your bonds and put it into cash. Well, at 92%, yeah, they really are the same asset class. Gold. Gold is a bit of a tricky one. Should you be actually looking for a return? In which case we'll compare it with stocks. Or is it actually a replacement for currency and therefore we should more compare it with cash? For some people the answer is definitely cash because once those solar flares knock out the electrical grids man, you'll be going back to gold and your fiat currency will all blow up in your face. Oh, well in which case I should actually be comparing the three Gold against stocks to check if there's any return, and then cash to see how that works out. Over 35.2 years. High interest savings account versus the S&P 500 converted to Australian dollars versus physical gold. And red's up the top. What is red? Well, red is the stock market, right? Next is blue. What is blue? Cash. Oh, and then gold down the bottom. So over 35.2 years, cash in the bank has actually outperformed gold. Yes, that's what the data says. The CAGR of the bank is 6.14%, shares have returned 10.6%, gold 4.3%. I did not think it was that low, but there you go. Now the question is, is gold a safety net for when stocks plummet? Or maybe cash plummets, cash never plummets. But is gold actually uncorrelated to cash and to stocks? Well, here we go, well the data's in front of you. Cash versus gold in Australian dollars, 95.2%, incredibly correlated, huh. Stocks versus gold, 86.9%. Look, all three are highly correlated. But as you can see, cash and gold are the most highly correlated to the point where it's virtually the same asset class based on that data. That's a correlation. How predictable within itself is each of these asset classes? This is cash physical gold in the S&P 500 with their line of best fits drawn through. So this is nothing to do with returns. It's only up to the individual graph itself. Over 35.2 years, cash has had a predictability of 98.1%. That's incredible. Yes, it's that impressive. Stocks, 85%. Huh. Now, I wonder if that stocks itself, and I've just grabbed a particular period of time, or whether the conversion back to Australian dollars has caused that. Interesting. Gold, on the other hand, minutely more predictable than stocks. Well, let's call it more or less the same amount of predictability. Bitcoin. Uh, excuse me, Sebastian, you've actually done entire videos denouncing Bitcoin. Why is this in your video now? It is it true that if I actually invest in Bitcoin, my wife will leave me, my mother will never ever speak to me, and I'll have to go and live in a share house with the Bitcoin bros? Yes, that would definitely happen. But I have the actual data in Bitcoin, and I am 100% objective in the data I present. Okay, let me zoom in there. This is Bitcoin in Australian dollars. Obviously, the cash in is Australian dollars and the US stock market is in Australian dollars. So this is all Australian dollars. And, well, look, there's some one thing that stands out and that's a great big blue wiggly thing and I cannot see any of the rest of the graphs. Are they there? Yes, they are, but they're so small, you can barely see them. So, the Bitcoin in Australian dollars, it has returned 36,400,000% over 12.7 years. Am I making this up? No, I am certainly not. Cash has returned 98.8%. 
The S&P 500, 519%, but it's not 36,400,000, is it? No, it's not. The question is, why is Bitcoin getting such a ridiculously high return? How is this actually happening? Well, my graph goes back and it goes back all the way. In May 2010, Californian student Jeremy Sturdevant, then 19, noticed a bizarre request on cryptocurrency internet forum. He could receive 10,000 Bitcoins at the time reportedly valued at roughly $41 in exchange for the delivery of two large pizzas to a Florida residence. A transaction that would become the first physical purchase made with Bitcoin in history, marked as the annual Bitcoin Pizza Day on May 22. So that happened in 2010. My data goes all the way back to, well, it's the same year. It's like two months later. Yes, it's exactly the same. So 10,000 Bitcoins for two pizzas. I don't know how much billions that would be in today's dollars. And my data goes back to two months after Pizzagate. Yes. And that's why we're seeing these really bizarre results because my data goes all the way back pretty much to the day of the pizza. Now, the thing is, it's nice to have these returns that I can present to you. But the reality is virtually 100% of people who own Bitcoin right now definitely did not own that two months after that pizza was sold. <laughs> but if you did, that's the sorts of results you'd get in my graph right now. Over the last two years, hang on, something's changed. Bitcoin, which is in blue, or so it's been in blue the entire time, suddenly has lost a lot, huh? And suddenly we're starting to see other colors come up, like orange, for example. Right, so what are the results? Over that period of time, Bitcoin has returned minus 40.7%. Huh. Cash has returned 4.23% and the stocks have returned 21.4%. Well, we know the returns. The question is how predictable is Bitcoin? Well, look, there's the line of best fit. You can see that in green. And what it shows you is this. And this is why I don't recommend Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin was, in fact, on an amazing trajectory up. You can see that's the line of best fit. That exactly where Bitcoin was going. And now it's dropped off a cliff, hasn't it? And it is not following that line. Bitcoin was on track to be the most amazing tulip bubble ever. I'm sorry, did I say that out loud? The most amazing asset ever and yet it didn't go follow through. Will it follow through in the future? Well, we'll have to wait and see. But let's have a look at the predictability. Bitcoin has a predictability of 88.6%. Wow, okay, that is not a number you're expecting. I'll explain why. The reason is that Bitcoin for most of its time was worth absolutely nothing. Remember the pizzas. And then year after year, it was worth basically absolutely nothing. And then it started to grow quite nicely and the graph actually matched up. And then only more recently did it drop down. So the R squared value, which is how closely a graph actually follows the line of best fit, actually calculates the entire history. And apparently overall, it hasn't done so badly. That's the math and therefore that's the result. Over that same period of time, cash has a predictability of 92.9%. Stocks actually has 97.8%, which is higher than cash in that period. Yes, it is. Over that entire period of time, how correlated are these three asset classes? Bitcoin and Australian dollars and the high interest savings account, correlation of 63.3%. Technically, that's still fairly highly correlated, but yeah, nowhere near as much as the others. Bitcoin and the S&P 500 is 82.4%, which is reasonably highly correlated. My job is done. I have shown you the following. Dividends and how they actually smooth out results over time, where the dividend actually does a lot of the smoothing. The ASX 200, we compare that with the S&P 500. We compare that with bonds, gold, and finally we end up with Bitcoin. How exciting. So I've actually taken all these asset classes and paraded them in front of you. Not only have I given you the returns, but I've also shown you exactly how much they're correlated to each other. Does one asset class protect when the other asset goes down? No, sometimes it doesn't and may surprise you. And also I've shown you how reliable they are. How closely do these asset classes follow their line of best fit? You now have all the data in front of you. Because of this video, you'll now have an intrinsic understanding of what asset classes actually impress you and what ones actually you want to avoid. Did you know I can tell you where to keep your emergency fund with proof? Wow, I want to see that. Click here to find out, or if you've seen that, click here.